Uh, welcome everyone. Hello. Thank you for joining us here at the Mechanics Institute. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events. And we're very pleased to have you here for our program, Outer Sunset, a novel by author Mark Poitier. Now, if you're new to the Mechanics Institute, we were founded in 1854, and we're one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers here in the heart of the city. We feature our general interest library on the second and third floors, the International Chess Club right down the hallway, and of course, our ongoing author events, literary programs, and our cinema and film series on Friday night. So please visit our website at milibrary.org to find out about everything we offer to you under one roof. This talk tonight will be followed by a Q&A with you, our audience. And we will also have books for sale and signed. Set in the pre-tech calm before the turn of the century, Outer Sunset is a deeply felt story about family and the places where long-lasting growth occurs in our lives and our families as well. Growth not in the spurts of adolescence, but perhaps the spurts that happen at older age and also the losses and gains and pleasures that come with that. Mark's stories have won the Chicago Tribune Nelson Aldrin Award and have been long listed for the Pirates Alley Faulkner William Wisdom Prize. He holds an MFA from San Francisco State and a BA from St. John's College in, in Annapolis and lives here in San Francisco with his family. So please welcome Mark Pompier. <laughs> some of it here, I've been a member since the uh, turn of the century. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's, a, it's a real treat to be able to have a book here and be feeling on the shelf soon too, but the distributors have some issues. So um, I would like to read to you the first uh, five or six minutes or so uh, from the very beginning of the book. That kind of says things like so. Three years ago, once it was clear our kids were gone for good, my wife packed the car with some clothes and things, told me she'd withdrawn half the savings, and after a farewell that I cannot recall verbatim, she left. Since that day, I've spent a good deal of my time reading in this back room. I drive all of this room, originally the porch for Jackie. The house felt smaller when the kids were young, and one day she said she needed extra storage for earthquake supplies. I'm a basement to speak of as the entire neighborhood is built on dunes. I was still working then. I used to be a high school English teacher. So I had some spare time one summer, and we never expected the landlord to do anything. For a few years afterward, Jackie made pickles, and she stored them in the corner where my chair is now. Sometimes that irony amuses me. The room is small, with two windows facing the backyard and a door between them. It turned out it wasn't practical to have two windows in a room room that would be used for storing pickles, but you can always pull a shade where a scene outside without a window is an entirely different matter. The room doesn't echo emptiness like most of the others, so I spend my time here comfortably enough. 
One thing can be said for aging and a certain amount of solitude. It helps you accept what you are and what you're not. And what you are not is carpentry. Norma, a gardener. When my daughter Dorothy visited so often out of concern, just after her mother left, she used to try to coax me back inside whenever she caught me sitting here, looking out the windows at the flowers and shrubs her mother had planted years ago. Because Dorothy is the most attentive person I know, I believe she worried that even the least reminder of my wife would crush me. I'm not as tender as all that, nor can you uproot recollections of more than 30 years so easily. Weeding through memories is a weed and chaff situation for me, so I try not to pull it by it. And besides, I wasn't just sitting here staring at the yard, which is still quite overgrown. I was also reading the pile of books I'd always said I would read if given a chance. Even now, when I look up to rest my eyes, I'm pleased to see the border blur as the weeds gain control and the roses dry to tangled dead bugs. That progress marks the passage of time, and it soothes me whenever I feel bitter. The last thing any self-respecting man my age should allow himself to feel after a drink. Another fact that I'm fairly resigned to is that I'm not and never was much of a writer. This realization was a bit trickier than with carpentry and gardening. Jackie might chuckle if I were to share that discovery with her now after so many years, but she's gone, and I've learned that the only way to be good company when you're alone is to be frank with yourself. It was just after she left, and my son Gerald had come back to stay with me for the summer. He'd been attending community college and living with his buddies and their pony-sized dogs and a big house on her end. And he said he needed to pursue some tech training after work down the peninsula, and that he preferred to spend nights in his old bedroom here near the beach rather than commute north through the fog each night. My guess was Dorothy had asked him to spell her for a few weeks and watch it over me. Either way, he was much quieter than I remember. Jackie had always said that I was too critical of him, and like so many of her other words, that poured back in her absence. I wondered if she hadn't been, hadn't been right in that too. So that summer, I tried to stay out of his way. And we fell into an easy routine. When he came home from classes, we'd chat a bit over a cocktail in this back room, and then I'd cook. After dinner, he'd go out or watch television in his bedroom. I'd stay out here. One warm evening, the fog didn't be begin to roll in until around dusk. Rare for us out on the coast in San Francisco. And as we sat before dinner, I noticed the rosy glow of the sunset as it reflected off the backs of the stucco houses behind mine. An autumnal light struck a eucalyptus tree outside the dark outline of my house, and the crisp shadows made each leaf distinct like big backlit stained glass. I was certain it was, would last only a moment, and I remembered the line of Wallace Stevenson's like the first light of evening. And as it grew darker outside my window, I closed my eyes to recite the entire final soliloquy of the interior paragraph. It's one of my favorites, although impossible to teach to high school kids. I memorized the poem when I was young, back when I thought it was the real world and not the imagined that held all the delight awaiting me in life. The poem itself was new then, and Jackie, to whom I once whispered it for the simple and closing sounds alone, had been young then too. It goes, out of the same light, out of the central mind, we make a dwelling in the evening air, in which being there together is enough. Oh my God. I thought I always understood those lines, but sitting there that evening alone in my throat, my life is mostly past, and I still have yet to say anything so beautifully. Behind me, Gerald, heavy handed me, is the dream. I'm not so cowed, though I told myself that such a delicate disappointment would make me weep. So by having acknowledged it, I expected the lump to go away. But it would not. It was fear, I think. I was instantly and deeply afraid that the solitude I'd garnered all my life would prove to be worth nothing. So when my son returned, I stood to embrace him for the first time in years, thinking one thing I am, and that I always will be, is father. But at the same time, I thought Jackie would like to see this. We fell away, he handed me my drink, he made plans to go out. So I can be more of you could ask questions. <laughs> yeah, oh. Are there any? Or okay. I have a question. Why did you why did you want to write this? Why did you what 
you you've said that this was going to be your friend, you know, and this is something you could talk with, and this is your, you know, communication. But have you always been a writer, or did you just suddenly decide to be one? Oh no, I've I've, I've been writing for a long time, mm -hmm. um, and I've uh, yeah, I got my MFA thirty years ago, and this grew out uh, actually out of a, a story that came from the program. Um, you're not lame, are you? By the way. I'm not what? You, re you, re you remind me of someone like Oh, no, I'm sorry. No, maybe. Um, no, so at State, I had a wonderful class with a professor named Michelle Carter. Um, this was in the, this is pre quake. And um, one of the exercises was to take a knot, like a, a moment in your life, of, you know, some twist, and um, write it from two different points of view. And um, in my case, my father's out of a cover, and my father was, he began to be the, the, the the prototype for this Jim character. That changes over one's life, but I'll tell you that's how it started. And um, I had written uh, first the, the son's point of view of a, a first dog that my dad would give me. And um, that didn't work so well. You know, and then I wrote from the father's point of view. And, um, wow. and then I, I handed it in, and the professor, and she just said, like, why are you doing this other crap? It's like, this is, this is your voice here. No, it's not this. <laughs> so, but I did, I did keep that up, but this, that story was completed, and that's the one that won the Chicago Prize, and that was 30 years ago. Oh, wow. Um, and then um, I came very close to, I had an agent. Um, I had a really good luck. I mean, I had um, Annie Crow um, was brought me to her agent. She brought my work to a couple editors, and for a moment there was like, this was lightning. And then, but I wasn't ready, um, and the work wasn't good enough. Um, and I have to trust all of that. So I actually stepped back, and um, uh, we were starting a family, and my wife and I are still each other. And uh, the kids are healthy too, by the way. So, um, but uh, it was just too much for me. I'm not the kind of person that can easily um, uh, uh, make a, do a full-time job and, and write like this. You know, I really like to just like zero and go, you know, just blow. So I have one more question, I, other people might too, but my other question is, because um, I am an attempting writer all the time, you know, from ages and ages and ages, and so I would like to, I want permission to steal one of your minds if I could, and that is to say I'm not much of a writer. I've never really heard that. It's so oh. <laughs> and I want to write it. Can I do that, or should I change the words? Let's not, no. you know. It's okay. It's yeah, okay. No, Great. Wait, Thanks. You know, wait, you want to read that? You want to read that? I got all steam signs. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No. Absolutely. It's a, there are a lot of people like us. You know, I turned uh, sixty-four before this book, just before the book came out, and it was. Um, I never thought this would happen. Oh. Honestly, and especially with COVID. I mean, I finished it yet. It's just because I was we were trying to sell it during that years, period. But um, there are many, many, many people. That's one, one of the best things about having this book out now is just meeting folks who are just saying, you know, I'm learning this. Yeah. And you know, the, the more you go into that story that you want to write, there, I swear, it's, 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 uh, it's, uh, it's framed. Yeah, and I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. We've got a microphone. I'm going to run it over and ah. give you the microphone. So you can hear me. Do you write from an outline, or do you just begin and go and not really know where it's going? That's one. Okay. And number two is, did you think a novel was the best format for this, or maybe it should have been a series of short stories? Let me do the second question. So I'm, I'm a novel reader. I, I actually have trouble reading collections of stories. There are some stories I love very much, and they're usually recommended. And um, you know, it's odd that I haven't been lucky with that one story. But I always, I've written several novels. This is not my first. Um, but um, so I tend to think and want, and my, my teeth get engaged in that kind of like. But um, I, uh, I don't have a system. Uh, the one I finished prior to this, which I still, I'm, gonna, I'm still working on. Um, wasn't going anywhere, and then I, I felt a need to, to re engage on a deeper level. And the story is always for me. The story was, um, like I said, good luck all along. Um, Ten years ago, um, there's a, an editor named David Wong. He worked for the Village Voice before, and he was engaged by Amazon to start the Kindle singles. Those, they were, and he, they were trying to do literary fiction. I mean, that's not what it is now. It's, it's kind of 
something else. And so uh, I, uh, he, they put a call out in Bugs and Writers who's got a story and wants to try an ebook. I've never seen ebooks like this before. That they, they seem to work. And he, he picked it up and it, it, it tore out. They really they, they packaged it in like a week. And um, mental editing it was and they, they just 15, 15,000 people downloaded it. So it was a real kick for me. And then I thought, well, that's really engaging people because I didn't think anyone would like that story that much. Um, I should. I would like to explore this more because I've never retired of the character. The other thing, though, and back to your point, is that I became this father, you know, in a way. I mean, there's a lot of these, a lot of these uh, issues and things that I've read through. Um, you know, they start really purple and really big, and just over sentimental. Um, um, that's me. And then, um, then you start to see, and the shape comes from there. That's where the story. So I don't use a plot outline at all. This thing starts to kind of erupt forward. Characters come. Um, the decision to um, to have the daughter get sick was a real surprise. One I was not comfortable with at first, but it, it was the right thing to get this guy out of his head because he's very self-involved and he's he's honest, but he's not all the way. I mean, he's he's alone for a reason, and so um, uh, I wanted to I wanted to push through that, and um, a lot of things just kind of grew. Right now. And uh, I had time. Um, I was uh, underemployed <laughs> for a while, and. Um, uh, uh, that was a real boom. Yes? Come your way. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that you had written several novels before this one, and forgive my ignorance, but is this the first that's been published? Or yes, yes, it is. Could you tell us uh, a little about your path to publication? For this book, or just in? Well, whatever you like. Whatever, okay. Um, you know, I was one of those people who always wanted to be a writer. Um, I grew up in a, uh, in a small farm in that case, and my parents were back to the earth in the 70s. So, but, um, uh, and I was first, first to college, so I had a really, it was kind of self-directed, and I thought, you know, if you want to write great books, you go to like the Great Book School, which is where I met my wife, who is a native of the Bay Area, and then we moved here to North Beach, because that's where writers move, you know? <laughs> and, um, and we did that, so, but the, my work wasn't anywhere near. And so it was wonderful to go to state where you meet a lot of people at various stages. Um, there are some fantastic professors. It's also it's a DIY place. You really kind of you have to engage and make it work for you. So, um, and it, it 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 did ultimately. And I also it's been a, a work skill that I've used. So I've, I've done mostly communications for them. I worked for the state courts. I worked for a couple foundations, uh, California Humanities, and that also kept me in the loop with people who were. We're publishing fiction, like, um, especially in the anime yeah. so, um, so I saw the folks, but I didn't have any work to get published. And this was, I've tried before, and I've been looking for a short story. That was out of my hands. That was kind of, I was, I was dreaming that this was going to be this perfect scenario where you win the prize, and you get the agent, and you're the bestseller. But in this case, it was, it was much more slow going, but it was also less broad. Um, I felt more confident. Um, I feel very confident. The book turned out, there's hardly any developmental ethics in the program. This is copy editing. It was a pleasure to have so much control over the book. The downside of that is it's really hard to work out of the small press. I mean, it's just not a good story. Not many stories. But you can gather it's like this. So is that enough? Does that answer that? Well, well, how Are like you the mechanics of like how I got the agent? Yeah, how did you come to, to get this one published? Um, when I was done, I started um, acquiring uh, agents. I, my old agent didn't want, um, she didn't want, she looked at it twice. And then there were a few times um, I had some engagement with a few others, but I went, I used the product called Query Tracker, uh, which is online. It just tracks all of your communications with agents, and I started blitzing. I did, that would be five a week. Um, and if there was somebody who wanted to see it, there were people who stopped or wanted to hold it for a while, I would slow down in the process. But you're basically waiting and you work on something else. And I did that for over two years. I went through over 200 agents that were. So, and this, um, my current agent, Farley, um, he had rejected me <laughs> a year uh, prior and then. Um, Neither of us knew, and I had lost track of it. So when I did the game, he said, like, sure, we'll see. And we didn't, we didn't realize until I went to meet him in New York that he, um, we were partying. You know, 
I don't know if you noticed it. I used to yell, I used to just come out. So, so, so anyway, he, so he, he took me on very last, it was my last try. And then with him, he tried every press during COVID. And it took, um, it took uh, almost two years. Then after that, though, um, he, he uh, ran into a sales rep for University of Chicago District. And um, that's who we go through. And he said, you know, you might want to try this guy in Iowa. He's really, this sounds like a book he'd be interested in. He really liked it. And he wanted to talk to me first for about an hour on the phone. And uh, we, I just noticed him. He, he got it, and I felt like, you know, it's, it's wonderful. He said, well, I'm not going to get you rich. He's going to get you published. And uh, they're, they're very respectable, and he had treated nicely. So it's good. Um, so it was slow. It was definitely, I had to be patient. Like, I couldn't. And you're saying there wasn't many changes made? No, no. I mean, copy of it. Um, and most of those were uh, things I'm not used to, the sensitivity of it. I've never heard of this before, but there are actually Google tools that you, you put a, a manuscript through, and they're like, I was, this word chubby, like I called the daughter chubby at one point, because she was chubby, she's a little girl. Yeah. And, um, you know, some people be offended at that. Oh, so yeah. I, that one, I, I, just, I switched because I could come up with a better word, but deaf, you, a couple other things that are very functioning words that um, I use in the full, I hope deaf, um, I was called out for. So that's, that was a lot over the process, but that, that, those are the only types of changes we did. That and um, um, this, in fact, that it really needs to go into the book like this. Stop. How did you decide when to end the story? Um, that was the, the one of the best learning things of this is that I really that's when I knew I was more than sure right? because there's always something you can see that needs to be changed until there is it's just like you just keep going, 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 going. I don't mean in the edits. Um, in the story. I knew it was going it was coming to that meal. And then the meal that had to be written so many times <laughs> because everybody's doing this, you know, you, you start to imagine it more than you feel it. And um, uh, it, it's, the answer to your question is that it's, it's a feel, but you have to just keep doing it. And then you have to keep throwing away everything that doesn't feel true and, and, and plausible. It's mostly true, though. I mean, like, I had to go, you could constantly go back into the characters. You know, I would have trouble, especially like, what's Jackie? All about in this last, that's the mother in this last scene. And I had, um, I had to, to just keep, it's almost like trial and error. There was a book, this came up in the last reading, um, it's by George Saunders called, uh, I think it's Swim in the Pond in the Rain. Oh, yeah. Okay. Is that the name of it? Yeah, Swim in the Pond in the Rain. That's, I don't know, I think that's perfect a a description book. of the writing process that. I use at least where you you know, and that's how the shape comes out. You just you might have a pile of stuff. I mean, I write longhand, and it was this big, and half of it was and it's because you can tell when it's just too much. It's just purple or not real. But um, this it it clicks, and um, there's things that are just you know they're gifts too. Like doing that movie at the end, I just I never knew that was going to be that. But that's absolutely that's that's the crossover that has to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Something else. Exactly. Um, Mark, can you <clears throat> talk about your prior novels and about the themes or what influenced this particular novel or the genre or the style of what you were doing prior to today? Uh, with this, I can say with this story, if you want to. In terms of influence, I was very moved by Andre de Buse's father's story, a father's story. I'm not anyone knows that. It's a really, really fine short story. I highly recommend it. It's um, in all those anthologies, it's his best thing. And I read that a lot of the state. Um, that opened up for me the idea of the feeling that you can inhabit these spaces in which I hadn't done anything like that before, which says I love life for that too. Um, uh, my other two novels, you know, the one that I'm um, most pleased with and want to work on more is um, it's set back more, um, and it's a rural setting back east, it's more of a, a daughter actually, kind of trying to find a, a lost mother in the midst of a, kind of a, you know, kind of neo-hippie leftover 
kind of environment, and the North Country, which is sort of the high so the way up on the same ones, really, it's really cold. And um, uh, uh, that was, I couldn't tell you where that came from, except that I know that place, I know these characters, and there's some people on it. It's almost always a character, a person that you want to unwind and help yourself get, you know, on FaceTime, so. Um, the first what, was one the was, what was the name of that last one you mentioned? The uh, short story? Yes. A father's story, and then the next one, about the girl. Oh, that's mine. That's, uh, that's the one I'm working on. What okay. was the name of the writer? The writer of the father's story. Oh, oh, of the father's story. Yes, I'm sorry. Debuse. Debuse. Not the third. That's his son. Andre Debuse. Andre Debuse. Thank yeah, you. He's passed. Um, he's a great guy. A great writer. I don't know if he's a great guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, uh, my first novel was more, of course, like kind of a young man coming of age, one of those, it was the 80s, who, you know, I was in school with Paul Bronson and some other guys like that. We were all doing those things, and, uh, and I was not successful. They weren't, and uh, uh, I was living in life here, it wasn't so, it wasn't so important. And, um, uh, I think the best place I'll go in the future when I'm writing will go into a character, into a person who either I feel I am or I know really well, you know, I want to, want to sort. I was, I was wondering um, if you considered self-publishing. Because, because you, um, I was wondering if you considered self-publishing since you had a hard time. For some reason it's not working. It's um, awesome. Okay. Just hold it up to your hold it up. Okay. Yeah. So my question was, um, I was wondering if you considered self-publishing, and if you, why did you reject that option and continue looking for an agent? Because some people just now that you've got Amazon and you can sort of market everything yourself and find your audience. Why did you reject that option? I mean, tell me if I go too much into it on now, because um, I learned a lot from the Kindle singles. Um, that experience, in theory, you're self-publishing. But it was cho chosen by Amazon, um, and I did get some editorial suggestions from, from David. And then um, they do the cover, they do you know the, the flat copy and such. And then um, one of the reasons it did so well is that they wanted to establish these Kindle singles, and so I was right up front. They own the bookstore, right? So you're right there, and um, there's no way people are not going to see you when they get their Kindle, which was brand new for Christmas. Um, so that experience was, you know, was very easy. I mean, it almost felt too easy. I, I never um, felt comfortable that this was true literary activity, but it is, you know, so the story stands. I have another one now, too, that's still on there. Um, uh, but, so I thought, like, well, if I can, if it's, you know, if I'm getting too old to publish, like, I really want to do some books, and um, I want, you, you can't just dump, dump them all at once. You want to have to put things in the lab, or a career, and have careers. And um, uh, I had considered self-publishing, but there are some reasons I would not want to. One is that I really do value um, presses, and I value editors, I value input, I value teamwork, and um, I'm really um, not that vain that I think I could have done it all smoothly myself. Um, I did try a couple of short stories on my own that became Kindle Signals, but I, I initiated that, and then I think that one of them, at least when I'm too early, so it's that you, you really want you know, there's a reason there's a, there's a real good, I mean, editors have a really good respect for it, so. Um, and then um, uh, you don't get respect <laughs> that you do if you have a book or a publisher. And it's also an ecosystem I didn't understand. I mean, I'm, like at that prom review, I think some people have seen it. That was amazing. That was a gift. I don't know how I think about it, but um, I really want something like that. You're not going to get that in self -published. So self-publishing, I do know some people have done wonderful things. and. Particularly if you're not necessarily like lit fiction, and you're doing like a genre or it's more um, for a really specific audience that you know, there people are very well served there of all, all interests. So um, I had considered, but I really wanted to make sure I had exhausted every, every avenue, and I almost did. But we didn't, so. oh, wait, oh. excuse me, I'm going to take a question in the back oh, first, okay. and then I'm we'll so, come so, back. Yeah. Here's one. In regards to the story, how did you pick the location as far as the neighborhood to, to how the story takes place? There's a lot of options you have, but what was it about the neighborhood you know, that motivated you to write about and take place from the novel? Um, 
that, that ground the short story, first of all, and the short story of the place there because it's just the perfect stage for them. It's, um, it's so, in some ways, and particularly when I started it, because the climate has changed some out there, it was so gray and cold and gloomy and moody and low rems at that point still. And um, this guy on the porch, you know, I just thought, like, oh, you know, and even the porch itself is like a microcosm of even the house of the, of the neighbor. It's just like, you know, you're in there and um, all um, just, but with the windows and the door, you know, you have some control in your privacy and people let you live their lives. Um, I couldn't think of it any other place. And then um, it's, just, it's poetically perfect. It's just um, on all these metal levels, it just looks so cool. I also like it being the outer edge of the United States, just the outer edge of our American dream and um, and this guy's life and, and so on. It's just it's too there are too many things. It just kept on unfolding every time. So it's a great place. I mean, <laughs> we live in the outer Richmond, not the outer sunset, but um, and the outer sunset is changing a lot, but it still works that way. It's great now. Question over here. How did you choose your readers? And who were they before? You know, when you're doing your going through your editing. In addition to that, um, artificial intelligence one that said, "Don't use Cubby." Cute. <laughs> uh, what was it called? The Chubby. 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 Uh, um, I don't think you have anything to fear with the AI in, in the world of literary fiction, but everyone else here. Um, uh, uh, my wife is my first reader. We've known each other for 35 years this September, and. Um, uh, she's always going to tell me the truth. So there's that. Um, I have another friend who's far away. Um, so we only communicate through email. We have almost all, all the time. He's brutal. <laughs> and you, you can't really pull it on him um, over text or email. You know. So, and then after that, um, I feel pretty confident after that. Honestly, my my agent and I have I think slightly different approaches to it, and that's a good thing. So he'll read it one way, and then I'll get. Either a peripheral answer from him, or else I'll know, you know, something's wrong. I need to work on as well. So I keep it. I don't have a lot of readers um, um, because uh, I've been in groups. In the, when, I, when I was a young writer, it was really, really helpful because there are a lot of things I need to be caught on. Um, and now I think I needed more to really focus on. Because I, you know, you know when you write wrong, you just have to listen to yourself. And I'm one of those people that just takes time to listen to himself. So. Thank you. Could you, okay. <laughs> could you say something about your writing schedule, you know, your daily writing habits? Is it even daily? Yeah. I wish I had one now. Um, <laughs> um, and, um, and we have uh, our daughter came home, and so we have a 23 year old house we get have for about a year. We love her, but it's just it's a whole disruption because she has her life now. It's on ours. And um, uh, when I was writing this, things were much more uh, clear because I had a bar of office space near my home. Um, I had bartered some communications where for, I just had the key to um, actually, so it's an old convent on Geary and 23rd. Um, uh, it holds uh, by St. Monica's, and you no know, one was in it during the day. I could go to the top office at the kitchen. So I got my daughter out for the bus. Um, our son was out uh, by then. And then um, right in the morning, just um, really focused. And now there's no there's no traffic, um, traffic, which I like. Um, and then I'm longhand, just to get a big drive. And then I go home in the afternoon, usually type it up or edit it, or whatever I'm going to do. And that's, it took about two or three years to do that after I got the role. Um, and other stuff is always taking much, much longer. And like I said, I used to work here too. I would come on a, um, we call it writer's night. My um, wife would spell me with the last little two years. And I, would, uh, I would come down after work and just go into a carol on the second floor and uh, do my thing. So, and it's just, I like to feel really lonely and like isolated. And, to, to do this sort of thing. Okay. Everybody's different, but that's what I mean. Thanks. Um, I want to ask, you know I'm going to ask, <laughs> about the section of the book that I found to be a masterpiece of, stunning piece of writing. Uh, uh, so if I could ask about that. 
a little bit. It had to do with the section where uh, Jim distraught, completely distraught by his daughter's situation, just walked out of, this, of where he was and wandered over to a religious institution. And his experience there was something to read. Uh, and, and the reason I ask that question is because I'm my personal circumstance, non religious atheist person, and it moved me to tears. So it, that takes a lot when you don't believe in the, the power of what uh, a religious institution might be able to bring you, and it did. It actually did that. So there was something about the way you wrote that. It came from somewhere in you, and I'm wondering what that is, where that is, where it came from. Um, uh, to show the very best side of what a, a, a religious institution or a place can offer someone. And they clearly did that to them, to him, and then to you as well. It's, it's just pretty obvious. It's a big one, Mark. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was unique. And I'm glad. Thank you very much. It's very, very flattering. And then nice to be here. Um, let me go at it this way. Um, uh, first of all, there's always the Jim and me, and then, um, yes. and then, and I, I and, and through the process of writing them, I told you before, um, that it, it took a lot of writing to get that one clear. Um, and I, because there's so much that you can lie about around death and God and religion and where you and your conscience and how you feel about things. And I also um, have to be true to him, and I don't see him still as an 100% believer, but he is, and that I think we draw too many lines around what's religious and what's not. The foremost question took in my last three months, what the world is really playing in the book? But that's because it's kind of everywhere. It's like, we can't draw these lines. Uh, um, I believe in this continuum between um, the material and the divine, for instance. I don't think there's a is a break is that this where this post enlightenment phase we're going to now physics uh, says things about personality that we but I'm going to go that sounds like I'm going on. What happens to Jim in that moment is that he is spiraling into himself. He had his first um, beer that people call after he found out the, the, his daughter was just very good well after her chemo and uncharacteristically down. Um, and then he, he's clearly on the outside of Carol and uh, his daughter. Um, and, uh, and so he leaves his house and he's running out. He goes to the school where his kids used to go to school and he's on, on, the, on the fence looking in, clearly seen as an odd man who shouldn't be hanging on the fence. And then he goes to the church, which he had been brought to. And this is the cathedral on Geary, the big, beautiful one, um, that um, uh, his son's girlfriend had brought him to his place. And she's very proud. And he's very con by um, Xenia, that's her name. And her, her, she's so integrated into family and her faith and her politics and her everything. She's just there. She's present. She's like, I do, I feel I am. You know, there's no, there's no, um, if there is division in her, it's not anything she needs. Um, so when he comes face to face with this, um, the, the, the incorrupt remains of St. John of Shanghai, who's a Russian saint in the cathedral, I believe he has a, a moment of serious grace and he falls through. Every line he can tell himself. This is it. this is where he finally, finally lets go. This is the thing that happens before he crosses over into, uh, into accepting the gift of God that his daughter is, into accepting his talents and voices in his whole life. This happens right after that. And that's what that's you know, if that's not a, a miraculous act in some ways, I don't know what it is. Um, I myself have uh, I became a, a, an Orthodox Christian through uh, during COVID. I was always tending to it. I was interested in this. I've sung with a couple of people here from Slavyanka Chorus. I've sung with the, the Russian Chorus for a while. And um, uh, I was raised Catholic and lapsed and all this stuff. But um, through, um, I wasn't Orthodox when I wrote the book. And so I was probably struggling with also myself with some of this question. How much do you believe this? Or how much do people believe this? So that they say you can come and just say a prayer that's going to work for you. It's like, I don't, I don't think things are that simple. Um, so, and I didn't, I couldn't let it be simple there. Otherwise, it would be trite. I mean, this is a lot of, that's why it was so hard to write, because everything goes to this moment for him, and if I had found, you know, 
It was not tried. We tried. <laughs> <laughs> but does that answer? Yes. Okay. And by the way, when I say I have friendly Orthodox Church in America, I'd like to clarify that that's the, not the Russian Orthodox Church. Outside um, Russia, the Russian Orthodox Church that's in the Ukraine. This is, but it is Orthodox, so we're all still some sisters in these very complex political structures, but um, there's a lot of variety of opinions from here that side. I'm wondering if you have a favorite section of the book that you truly enjoyed writing, and and if we could hear that, like what really made your heart sing when you were writing it? I love the Paul story. Um, the, the kid in the school, uh, his, uh, his yeah. English class. And I would read that to you, it's a little lengthy, you know, about 10 minutes. If you want, I'll do it. Um, I love, I, I knew that I was a substitute teacher briefly, and as a PhD, um, just for some experience, it's a pocket cap. That's punishment. You pay for everything you ever did to a substitute. Uh, and, um, <laughs> and we, uh, I got really sick too uh, from the kids, uh, but, uh, but um, uh, I I knew a little boy named Paul on a field trip that I went on when my son was a first grader. He's the kind of kid who kind of tag along and he'd sit next to you and then bills through the alphabet as far as he could. And he, just, <laughs> <laughs> he could get to M, like I forgot, him, and he was really energetic. And so I had imagined him as a, as a, as a younger. So I'll, I'll, if you like, I'll read that and then Great. just put it on our and it's too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. No, it's because it's like a time this one. I thought she asked to do this. Mark, if you'd like to read, read on and then we'll have this book sign, signing and sailing and away we go. Okay, good. All right. Here we go. <clears throat> All right, so just to set this up. Um, this occurs all in the first third of the book, and um, Jim's son and uh, girlfriend come over for dinner, um, and they've had a pretty big night, and um, he's, uh, like Sammy, the girlfriend, reminds him of something that uh, he had forgotten. He's always going back into his memories. He just can't help but, but fall back, and so in this case, He's remembering at the dinner table with his son and the girlfriend um, what it was like teaching. And I will, <clears throat> I don't know how to do this. I'm going to start to say, right here, okay. All this is to say that my final year of teaching was no idol for anyone. He had um, started teaching, um, this was his last year, and it's after his wife had left. I have, a I have a request. Yes. Not to read too fast. Okay, okay. But yeah. if I go too slow also. Oh, not too okay. slow. Not too fast, not too slow. Yeah, right. I do go fast too, so. All this to say that my final year of teaching was no idle for anyone. I don't recall much of it. I'd let down all illusions knowing we were all at the end of our respective school careers. And I saw every day the finish line of a race in which I'd already not come in first. I even indulged in some role playing, wearing a sports jacket each day, using a fountain pen, lecturing gravely from my desk over folded hands. I'd also managed to eschew the personal computer that some corporation had been trying to insinuate into our classroom. And instead, I hauled an old book stand for the corner of my desk, where I placed the same moldy, unabridged dictionary I'd used my entire career. I raffled it off for free on my last day, and even then it was left behind in someone's locker. <laughs> <laughs> the book stand spun like a lazy Susan, and the dictionary was usually open to my students who were forced to use it almost as a penance. I would require the student to pronounce their word aloud, tell the class how it functioned as a part of speech, explain the set of etymology, and use it in a sentence. A few students loved being called to use the dictionary, but my abiding memory is that most kids shunned it and instead only asked the sorts of questions that led to discussion of our feelings. Anyway, there was a noodle house down across the tracks where a colleague and I would repair on Fridays for lunch and a quick beer during our prep hour. Thus fortified, I'd teach my honors class the last period of the afternoon. For teens, this is the longest hour of the week, a time of torpor, a torture to us all. And even though I never got much love from that late Friday class, I expected even less and the best I could hope was to keep most of them entertained. A few stoners were willing to join my game, addressing me as captain, because 
we watched the Poet Society together in class over two Fridays. And during their best, often successful, but they would do their best, often successfully, to launch me off on some subject on which they knew I'd all too happily sail. Clever, lazy, buzzed kids. Once I caught them wagering on who could get me talking the longest. That stopped one day when I confused them by threatening to place a bet myself. <laughs> this was just over three years ago, in 1996, just before Hong Kong's return to China and after the USSR's post glasnost collapse. And because San Francisco is such a small city and so densely packed, our public schools instantly felt like they'd been flooded with a fresh influx of Russians and Chinese. Of the former, Pavel was my sharpest and best loved student. He loudly and repeatedly announced that he had descended from Vladimir the Great. None of us knew what such a 1,000 plus year lineage meant, nor how to prove it, but looking at him, it was possible to believe. He was tall and narrow, with hair like rough cut hay, and a gray gem glint in his overactive eyes. His constant smile gave him a vulpine look, and he sometimes grew so animated that he seemed to be speaking in tongues, putting on characters and entertaining his classmates nonstop in the back of the room where he sat with his buzz to click. His family had been in the States less than three years, and although his spoken English was quite good, it had taken some very aggressive bullying on his father's part for him to get a slot in the honors class, because along with being one of my brightest kids, he was one of my worst students. <laughs> his handwriting was as good as graphic art as anything else, and he rarely completed the test before the bell because he could not stop talking, even if only to himself. At first, I'd moved him to a desk up front and center, and yet before I even noticed it happening, he'd slowly receded back, one desk every few weeks, bartering with and cajoling classmates until, lo and behold, there he was again, back in his former corner of power, where he'd started. Perhaps I'd unconsciously displaced him with new offenders up front to face the book, and I'd lost track over time of where Pavel was from week to week. Or perhaps I'd willingly let him get away with these shenanigans out of respect for his doggedness, or because I'd grown fond of him and the diversion he created for us all, or because he, for some reason, had grown fond of me. It had never been my intention to impress my students in any way by wearing a sports coat and carrying a leather book bag that year. It was just a costume to cover the nothingness I felt, a mask of faux pride in my work. And I think Pavel somehow ingeniously understood and responded to that better than anyone. My classroom was a gray sea of faces that year. And Pavel's was a white cap amid small waves. By mid-April, even just before fall, I'd come to look forward to seeing him shoot up from the back of my last class each Friday to the later some absurd point that would still manage to touch upon the entire week's discussion. My captain, he cried out one such day. Today I read that great, the great poet Wallace Stevens was a lush. His eyes popped with false indignation. Some kids laughed, others looked altogether baffled. You were reading, Master Powell. I'm impressed, I said, playing our game. But what is a lush? Where did you see this? In Florida. He was drunk. You were in Florida? He was. I was here in class. He was drunk. Wallace Stevens was a high level insurance executive in Hartford, Connecticut, I said. He smiled to hear me capitalize on the teaching moment he created. But it is true, I said, that he vacationed in Key West, so perhaps he read about what he did while he was on his spring break. He was, a very, he was very good at his day job. He was known as the Dean of Shorty. But Captain, he tried to fight with Hemingway. He was 50. He was an old man, and Hemingway, he was young and strong. He would beat him. He must be super drunk. Everyone relaxed into the game. Paul stood tall with his wet, wild smile, and I myself just had enjoyed the same town with lunch at the Kingdom of Dumpling. A cool, grimy fog spit through the shattered panes of our windows, ruffling the remaining window shades with a sound like distant sails taking wind. Ah, school days. Captain, would you, he said, if you got drunk, would you put up your fist to fight a strong young man, even if you were famous, poet? Who's drunker, I said. The young man or me? The dean of Shorty? I bet you are more drunk, he said. There was more good nature tittering around the room. But also, all eyes are on us. Well, tell me first, Mr. Pavel, what does surety mean? Hmm. And he held his chin for effect. Surety means to be sure. The dramatic lift of his voice and eyebrows at his own question also showed me that he was now engaged. 
You want to bet on that? I said, are you sure enough to bet me? And while I said that, and just as I had so many times during the year, I leaned forward from my desk to wrap my forefinger on the great dictionary that lay open on the front of the desk, screwing up my eyes like a bony old schoolmaster, jutting out my chin with just enough challenge to get a few hoops, and daring Powell to take it to the book. And he loved this. Without hesitation, he strode, strode up and bowed before the dictionary. Whenever Powell bent forward, he looked as if he were hinged at the waist. Next grade. Perhaps he really did have some noble and red blood. The class watched him breathlessly, his fingers riffling through the big pages like a sprinter kicking up dust until he stopped and slid his finger back down the page, peering closer. S-U-R-E-T-Y, he asked. You tell us, I said. Yes, this is how to spell the word. And I am correct again. It needs to be sure, guaranteed. There are other readings too, he asked. He slammed the book shut, surprising us with his witty thud. Yes, but this is all the meaning I want now. <laughs> okay, I said. So if you just now were a leader in the field of surety, because that's what they meant by calling him the dean, you would have known whether or not you were right about the definition you'd given me. And you would have bet and won, right? His eyes glittered as if he'd just risen from underwater. Ah, Captain, he said. And if I were a surety expert in the question you just asked me, I too would be sure of the odds for whether or not I could have beat the young man. And I could make a safe bet on that basis too, right? It had become too complex a question for anyone to laugh in class. Impatience flashed across Powell's face as he became aware that he might be losing the floor and his knees knocked back and forth. He was drunk on spring break, he blurted out. The dean of Shorty was what he did for work, and when he didn't work, he was drunk. He stared at me, he looked hurt. You smell like a beer, Captain, he said. I wasn't shocked by this, but it silenced me. It seemed to have silenced the entire room, too, for an instant. You, Pavel, will see me after class. I waved him away, even as he began his unsteady, slow job return back to his seat, slapping high fives down the long rows of desks. And I will stop there. I know it's getting long. But um, he, he goes to um, Pavel's house afterward, and I think that's a scene that's also a favorite of mine, too. Thank you very much. I'm really, really grateful that you showed up, and it's going to be a pleasure. It's been a pleasure for us. Thank you, Mark, and everyone can come back, buy a book, and Mark will be up front to sign.